Is Kath is uh, Kathleen on the phone? I'm on Zoom. She's using the computer, Ron. That's what us in the uh, 2020s do nowadays. <laughs> okay. Is Kilkenny a county in Ireland? It is. I it, thought it sounded familiar. It, it is not my county, but it is a county. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not my castle either, but I went to see it and acted like it was mine for a, a moment. <laughs> but yeah. Well, did you sign up for a, a portion of the family land holdings? <laughs> I wish, but unfortunately, my family doesn't come from exactly Kilkenny. It comes no, more North Ireland or like um, County Cork area. <laughs> Mayo, County Mayo, that's where we're from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's all the same. So. Are you, are you familiar with a Timothy Kilkenny who works in Oakland? Yes. yes. Do you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you know him? Well, I I know of him. I I helped bring him onto the department, but he worked at the USAR facility for a while, and I had nothing but rave reviews from him there. So, he's he's my first cousin. Yeah, my, her dad okay. and her brothers. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah. He's he's worked very very hard to get into the fire department and was very dedicated. So I'm glad yes. it happened. I am too. It's always one of those things where when you see someone who's put in the time and effort and, and really um, quietly works hard and gets it done from what I understand. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what you like, you know, yeah. you like Not people being boisterous too, but you know, it's gotta be a, a certain kind of boisterousness. He, he didn't strike me that way at all. No, no. So can, can we get him to Marinewood? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you he's might not want to EMT. Try. <laughs> he's not a he's not an EMT. I don't think. You so. mean, uh, uh, I don't think it was a paramedic. I think he was an EMT. Uh, yes, that you're right. He's not a paramedic, so right. he's off the run. Oh well, but yes, that's my cousin. See, All right. Eric, small world. Absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely. So. All right, I'm gonna leave you guys for a second and call Steve and see what's going on. Okay. Do these usually start on time? Yeah. Good. Okay. Nice. Did you come from Oakland? Is that why? Yes. Yeah, I, I um, retired from Oakland to join San Rafael Marinwood. You retired to continue to work. Yes. <laughs> we, we thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I thank you guys for the opportunity as well. It's It's been a very rewarding opportunity for me in more ways than one. And so I, um, you know, as I look at my professional growth and my personal growth and the opportunity that's been provided to me, it's been, you know, a great time and a great opportunity minus the pandemic, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> well, why did you move from uh, a location that had affordable housing to overpriced Marin? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not quite sure I can afford Marin. <laughs> yeah, who can? <laughs> yeah, today. So perhaps, perhaps if we see a, a lull in the market or something that takes place in the next few years, that would be helpful. But uh, I don't know that I can uh, be be very house rich and, and pocket poor. That that could be kind of tough for me. <laughs> the Marin way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's unlike very many places. It's very beautiful. You know, it's very. Um, uh, the climate is nice. I mean, I, I, when I, I'm here in Oakland or I'm in San Rafael, I feel like it's almost the same climate. It's, uh, yeah. um, you know, very kind and, and from what I can tell for the most part, um, physically fit recreational community. You know, people like True. getting out and, and doing active things. And, you know, I don't, I'm seeing more of that now in Oakland than I used to, but yeah. I think that's because we have a lot of folks who are either from a different generation or some of the folks who are kind of uh, returning to Oakland because they see it as a, the, the, the jewel that it now is starting to finally become after so many years of neglect or just bad reputation. Well, and I think more, more and more of the, how do I say this politically correct, more and more of the nice, nicer areas are starting to get an even better reputation and then they start enjoying Oakland and it just spreads from there. 
Yeah, I think that helps. I think, um, and when you get positive press and you have people that, you know, are speaking to the highlights of the community versus, you know, the, the way the media used to portray the city quite often, it was, and, and deservedly so at times, you know, it was yeah. just kind of like right now, I think about all the crime and everything that spiked here in the last several months. You know, it, it reminds me of the late 80s, early, early 1990s. Mm -hmm. when, you know, things were just truly out of control. And it's returned to that somehow in the midst of all of the development and all of the positive things that are happening. It's so it's hard. a tough dynamic, but it, it, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it. And, and I don't want to be judgmental in any way because I, I've read and I'm understanding gradually and slowly, but surely how decisions were made that impact different areas of society and different areas of a city, you know, and so as a result, uh, resources aren't always allocated into certain areas and that just continues to keep the the uh, I don't know I'd say destitute conditions or or less than ideal conditions um, as part of the reality I mean I I grew up yeah. in East Oakland but in other parts of the city also and I've watched change in other areas bring about some positive and and um, enthusiastic behaviors but there's certain areas that haven't gotten that same attention and because of that I think it 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 communicates something to the, the residents there, so. Uh, true, I yeah. mean, I think, I think everyone has to care about the same communities, all the communities equally, and then the people who live within them also care about their own community just as much. So well, it helps, it helps, and if you're not a homeowner, I think that, that kind of creates a little bit of a, a circumstance too, where people don't take as much pride and ownership if they don't, um, uh, if their name isn't on the D per se. True, true. Yeah. True. All right, Eric. I, I just talked to Steve. He's having some connection issues and other issues with his computer. So he's just, he's calling in right now. So he he should be in on this in just a couple minutes. And if he doesn't, we'll just move on without him. Okay. Well, that makes me feel better about not having a computer. <laughs> I would like to do without my computer maybe for a week. That would, be, that would be pretty amazing. I probably would have really bad withdrawals, but I might like it. Give him one second. I don't know why he wasn't able to get in. Everybody else is able to get in. I think it's a technical issue on his end. I had to do it uh, three times before I could get in. Just Tom. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know. Maybe it's an issue with uh, the Zoom app or something. What was it telling you when you tried, Tom? It just didn't go through, and I'm on the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Hey, Eric, one thing I've noted is uh, the original invite from July says that this is a recurring meeting up until last month. Yeah, but I, uh, I've extended that. Okay. So that, that shouldn't matter because I've added additional dates and it's all the same link. I, I didn't change any of the uh, any of the links just because, you know, I had to resend out all sorts of invites. And um, I did that with all of the, uh, both commissions and the board. That I way, think it's just something let's I get going. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. So, uh, more second but hopefully he jumps in and figures it out or gives me a call back um all right who wants to uh run the meeting not it not i said tom okay well happy to push it forward if you guys want uh, it's up to all of you typically it's a commissioner but uh since we've got two well, people on the phone uh and one more it might be easiest if i do it I'm gonna, yeah, go I'm ahead. Gonna yeah. A new card. All right. Um, well, then I say we go ahead and start if everybody else is okay with that. I'm okay. I'm okay with it. Good. Okay. Um, are there any uh, changes to the agenda? Tom, I have none. Great. I move we approve the agenda as presented. I will second it. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
Perfect. Um, okay. Uh, before we get the public comment, I didn't put it on the agenda, but just uh, give uh, Kathleen a chance to introduce herself. Uh, just so everybody knows, Kathleen joined our board in December. And then at their uh, board meeting in January, the board appointed new liaisons to both commissions. And Kathleen was very excited to get on the fire commission. So uh, Kathleen, if you just take two seconds and uh, give everybody a little uh, something about yourself. Um, all right, so I have, was born and raised in Marinwood. I live on Quietwood. I'm sure all of you, if you have children, you've been to my block on Halloween. Um, I'm actually looking forward to learning more about what the fire commission does and be part of, you know, the board and the CSD and moving this forward. Uh -huh. And I'm pushing Steve in right now. Perfect. Do I have to repeat myself? Just no, I think you're all right. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I'll set up a time for you guys to chat. All right. <laughs> All right, let's see. Oh my gosh. You're in, Steve. Oh, you're in. Welcome. Okay. Yep. We can hear you. We just, uh, okay. Kath Kathleen, just so you know, uh, I wasn't sure if you're going to make it. So we went ahead and got started. The agenda has been adopted. Kathleen introduced herself and then. And I was thinking it might be good if we just go around the table really quickly for everybody else to introduce themselves to Kathleen. Okay. Why don't you start, Steve? Sure. I apologize. I've had nothing but trouble with my computer the last few days, and uh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I'm Steve Farrak, and uh, I've been a former firefighter and uh, been with the commission for well, it's about three years now. So... Nice uh, welcome and nice to have you here. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Ron? Yeah, Ron Marinoff. Uh, bought my house in uh, Upper Lucas Valley, County Service Area 13, uh, in 1963. And I'm not going to tell you how much I paid for it. <laughs> so there's no sadness. And I was a volunteer fireman uh, for 12 years, and then I got a little out of shape to run up and down the hills. So I asked to be appointed uh, to the fire commission, and I've uh, been on the fire commission for, I don't know, 35, 40 years now. Wow. All right. So that Kathleen knows, as part of our agreement, our annual agreement to provide fire protection to CSA 13, uh, Ron lives in CSA 13, so he serves as their rep. So within our bylaws and as part of our agreement, we have one member on the fire commission from CSA 13 plus a alternate from CSA 13, which is Greg Stilson, who couldn't join tonight, but Greg also serves as the uh, chief of the volunteer uh, department. Okay. Uh, who wants to go next? How about Tom? Tom. Okay, my name is Tom Ellsbury. Uh, I uh, became a member of the Marinwood Fire Department, I would say around 1975, 76. Uh, I, I quit active duty with them. I was a captain in the volunteers. And uh, I've been a member of the uh, fire commission ever since. I live in uh, Marinwood. Um, our kids uh, went to uh, Carolinda High School and our grandkids as well. So that's my story. Nice. Right, I'll go next. I'm Pascal Carcenti. I have been living in Marinwood since 2012. Uh, I have never been a firefighter of any description. Uh, but I am uh, professionally a catastrophe modeler, so my job is to, my training is to assess the risk of natural catastrophes and what impacts that risk. Um, and um, yeah, I've been doing that for about 15 years, and I've been on the commission since, I believe, 2016. Nice. All right. And you know me, and you've met the chief at a, the last couple board meetings. Uh, 
I would say with that, um, Steve, I'll turn it over back over to you and uh, we're on public comment. Okay, very good. So uh, any public, any comment from the public? No, you can okay. go. Okay, no comment. Okay, very good. Let's go to uh, item number three, which is the commissioner items of interest. Do we have anyone from the commission that has items of interest? Uh, this is Tom. I do not have one. Okay. Ron, anything? No. All right. I, I don't have anything either. So uh, we shall bypass that and go on to the next. The next one is number four. Um, the draft minutes of January 5th Fire Commission meeting. Anybody have any comments about that? Uh, this is Tom. I have no comment. I was not at the meeting. Okay. Ron, anything? I move we uh, approve the minutes of the last meeting. Okay. Do I get a second? Yep. I'll second. Okay. And uh, there, I, I approve, then well, let's make a motion to approve the draft minutes of the January 5th commission meeting. Right. All right, we'll go to number five, which is- hey, uh, Before you skip through, you got make sure you ask for public comment on these. Oh, sorry. Any public comment on uh, item number four, which is the draft minutes of January 5th? No, there's no public comment. Okay. Let's go to the uh, Chief's Officer's Report. Uh, Chief, I hand it over to you. All righty. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you for joining me here this evening. Um, I do have one correction I have to make right away to the very first line in the report. It says Marinwood Board of Directors, and I didn't catch that oversight um, until after I'd already sent the report to Eric. So my apologies. Um, should be the Marinwood Fire Commissioners. That being said, I'm gonna move right down into the items on the report, the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority and Vegetation Management. Um, recently, reimbursement checks were provided and forwarded to the different agencies from the local and the DSpace funding um, sources. Uh, my understanding in speaking with the executive director, um, the revenues received were roughly one or 2% higher than anticipated, which is, Actually, good news. Um, that being said, I hope that continues to be the trend moving forward year after year. Uh, they did start the recruitment for the emergency planning um, and program manager. It's supposed to start sometime, I believe, this week or next week. And in addition, a draft request for proposal, an RFP for an environmental services expert has been drafted. And there's, they're anticipating the selection of an individual or a firm that will be able to assist with the 21-22 work plan, which uh, that's going to be a major undertaking. I think it's going to entail a lot more than what our initial work plan entailed for 2020-2021. And that is also going to lead to some of the larger projects that we had not been able to get off the ground during the initial launch of the first work plan, given we knew we had limited funding available to us from the two 20% pots as opposed to core funding available for this first go around in 2020, 2021. So all that to say, um, the individual that's selected should have subject matter expertise that can provide each individual agency um, with some of the support needed to ensure that they're using and um, considering and taking into consideration the, the feedback and concerns of some of the ecological and environmental um, subject matter experts. And so uh, we're looking forward to having that level of assistance. I can tell you also that in our hiring process for uh, San Rafael specifically in Marinwood, we've selected individuals who have expertise in recent certification in um, forestry and other areas, which we think will segue specifically into ensuring we're doing everything environmentally responsibly and as well as um, ensuring that things have the CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act requirements adhered to. So, uh, very fortunate. We've got a great crew of individuals as vegetation management specialists with specialized training certification and in some cases experience that's going to be very useful moving forward to us. Zone Haven is uh, recently been contracted also and their 
due to begin their work sometime here this month and concluding from what I understand as early as May. So for those of you who are not familiar with Zone Haven, it's a um, evacuation management platform that is gonna be very, very supportive of incident command and or law enforcement, Office of Emergency Services, fire and others, including community members having real-time situational awareness about uh, things that may be of concern, fast moving wildfire or hazardous material spill or leak, uh, need to evacuate which zones uh, need to evacuate and in what order and when. So this is, um, this is a tool that's been in effect. I'm, I'm familiar with this tool from my days in Oakland. They had actually just started a task force that um, were well, actually part of my arrival to task force was wrapping up its recommendations and moving forward with implementing Zone Haven. Um, Zone Haven has been working in Contra Costa County, uh, San Mateo County, uh, Alameda County now, as I stated, Santa Cruz, um, uh, Sonoma County, and on some of the major incidents over the past uh, last year or so, some of the major wildland incidents. So the tool has been put in place and actually utilized um, effectively. And so we're, we're really encouraged by what we think this tool is going to do to bring a variety of folks together um, and, and deriving a solution that will help in some ways that we can't currently do without that tool, which is providing that information that can be transmitted directly to the community members on an application on their devices. So more information will be coming from that or uh, about that in the report I have in the month ahead. The, 2020 Marin Community Wildfire Protection Plan was released and has a lot of information. This is a large document that contains uh, a lot of very solid information. And so I encourage um, individuals to go to the website. It's www.firesafemarin.org slash CWPP and take some time to kind of thumb through it. There's some information that's probably going to be specific to your area, your um, zone, uh, the community that you live in. And this good information on a what's called a story map. Click on that and get more details specifically. Um, Fire Safe Marin has also provided a newsletter, a monthly newsletter, and they're looking for additional subscribers. They've um, updated much of their website content as well, and they've provided um, additional video library content to the tune of some 70 plus videos now found on the website. And so with that, I think you'll find and pleasantly find that there's a lot of uh, very valuable information there as well. So I encourage folks to join that uh, or subscribe to that monthly Fire Safe Marin newsletter and go to firesafemarin.org. Um, and there's a, from what I understand, a red button that's on the landing page and it says subscribe to our newsletter. And it's as simple as that. So some very good information coming forward this this winter as we move into spring and summer months uh, we anticipate again um, a lot of work to be done but uh, also a lot of challenges that lie ahead so the mwpa funding i gotta tell you it's it's huge to me i i just i wish there was something like this happening in alameda county um, you know we had a wildfire prevention assessment district that was not renewed and as a result people were coming with their hat in their hand to the city council every year to try to get funding right now in a pandemic you can only imagine how tough that is so that marin county really got ahead of this the way they did is it's going to think i believe set an example and a model for other communities throughout the um, western states to to really emulate when they see how this works and how successful it's going to be We're really excited to be part of this moving on to guidelines and COVID. sorry for detracting but i just had to share that um the most recent surge in coronavirus cases is actually starting to finally decrease in both Marin and the Bay Area. Um, with those drops, however, though, is uh, just the lack of vaccinations and vaccine being provided to the Marin County and or, you know, almost from what I understand, the state. And these shortages aren't just affecting um, us here in California. I've had some conversation with my mother who lives in British Columbia, Canada, and they're experiencing some of the same problems and it's pretty frustrating. It just goes without saying that um, something's missing somewhere. I don't really have a, a full understanding of what the challenges are, but I've read something in the Marin um, IJ today that said 
48 million vaccine doses have been released to California, but only 26, uh, 26 million administered, or roughly similar numbers. And I, I just, I, I'm at a loss to understand why that is, but I'm just sharing that information because um, something's not going well, and I hope that there's some correction and some plan to correct quickly, especially when you consider that the president indicated his goal was to have 100 million people vaccinated in 100, his first 100 days. Um, we're not really off to a good start, but hopefully that'll change and get momentum as some people put their really some serious mind and logistics behind this and start moving this in the right direction. Um, the stay at home order was recently lifted as of a week ago and a day ago, uh, eight days ago, and that's, that's huge. It allows um, restaurants, some more outdoor dining to resume, um, some other consumer operations to reopen where businesses can actually serve some customers in, indoors now, such as nail salons, hair salons, and uh, barbershops. And heard a funny story today about, you know, someone sitting in a barbershop, but then I also heard briefly as I was walking out the door, maybe one of the uh, individuals is playing in the Super Bowl will not be playing in the Super Bowl because he may have gotten COVID at the barbershop. So I just... I didn't really get to, to know whether or not that's actual and factual because I only heard it in passing. But um, as you can see, I don't have that problem. I'm my own barber. So <laughs> hopefully I can uh, <laughs> hope, hopefully I can do something about my son's hair, though. He's got his hair is down to his shoulders now. So we'll see. Um, that being said, um, a lot of changes coming based on being a purple tier. And as being a tier, um, means that us, like many others, still have a lot of restrictions, despite the fact that um, the states moved us to that level. So um, there's so many facilities that will now be able to resume in uh, commerce. And I know that it's going to be a relief to them financially and otherwise. But um, the fact that we've still got so many businesses reopening or are allowed to do commerce, uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we still need to maintain uh, all of the best practices when it comes to protecting ourselves so that we don't still find ourselves impacted. I, I saw something yesterday that spoke to, we were down from 40,000 infections a day in the state of California to roughly half of that, 20,000 infections a day. That is just a astronomical number. And it really puts it into perspective that at any turn, you could almost be faced with coming into contact with somebody who's positive. When you start talking about 40,000 a day, you're looking at 4 million people or excuse me, 400,000 people in 10 days and well over a million people in 30 days. And so it just, it, it puts it on a different scale. But thankfully, the, the stay-at-home order is starting to turn the numbers in the opposite direction. And hopefully, combined with vaccinations, we'll be able to see that last surge as the last surge, hopefully. But not to be the purveyor of doom, I did hear about some, uh, or read about some, some new strains that are really problematic and they're concerned that those could really take effect as soon as April becoming the dominant strain. And some of them are somewhat resistant to some of the other vaccinations outside of Pfizer's. So that's a, a whole nother monster, but we'll see what happens with those variants or those mutations. Um, the, well, I spoke to the, the amount of vaccine not being really optimal. So um, the folks that are actually available for are, are able to receive vaccinations right now are still as of the 26th of January in phase 1A groups, which includes healthcare workers, residents of residential care facilities um, for the elderly, and Marin County residents age 75 and older. Um, I would I would have hoped by now we would have been able to move down to the residents who are 65 and older and start capturing a greater portion of of our Marin County residents, but that. From what I understand, that hasn't happened just yet, but maybe it's it's coming as more vaccinations surface. So I'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, I did have some data that I didn't have before on the number of persons who had actually received vaccinations, which um, was nearly 24,000 people had received them. 20,262 plus as of January 25th had received their first vaccination and 3,691 had received both doses. So, Depending again, I think everyone is aware that if you take the Pfizer vaccine, you have three weeks before you take the second dose. You take the Moderna vaccine, that's four weeks until the second dose. 
Uh, there's a couple others that are on the horizon, including Johnson & Johnson, um, AstraZeneca, and I can't remember the other name right now, but they um, have varying degrees of effectiveness, uh, but some of them only require one dose as well. So um, more vaccinations, the better, but I, I like the vaccinations that have 90 plus um, or 94, 95% effectiveness as opposed to 66 or 72% effectiveness. Even with some of the information we're seeing now, these vaccinations and those strains that I was speaking to are mutating. They're finding that different demographics respond differently to the vaccinations. So um, persons of color may have, in some instances with certain vaccines, less resistance um, or that vaccine may not be as effective for them as it may be for others. And so that's a, a concerning development as well. And so they're looking at potentially targeting certain populations right away to keep it from expanding into other populations. So those variants and those strains that I spoke of, they may actually be looking at how can they control that from being an explosive situation and start to provide vaccinations, heavy vaccinations in those areas to kind of keep that strain or that mutation for becoming the dominant strain and now thereby just almost negating all the value of the the vaccines that have been administered so far so um that being said there was a couple overturned vehicles uh, i showed photos of those from what i understand just minor injuries um but i think that has a, a lot to do with the weather and the rains and you know some of the oil lifting off of the surface of the ground and the the lack of traction it's you know usually occurs with sudden turns or with even speeding and turning the vehicle so uh, fortunately no serious injuries uh, today i met briefly with captain john papa nicola well we, we met for a couple hours actually i won't say briefly um he and i and uh, battalion chief paul bernard uh spoke uh, about the volunteer firefighter program talked over some historical perspective along with some of the challenges that have been experienced in recent times and some of the um, the suggestions and or uh, considerations when it came to the volunteer program. And so with that, uh, I think it was a pretty good conversation. I think um, they had to re leave to go on a run and actually their timing was, was pretty good. That allowed me to run over and grab this boot from Kaiser. So worked out for both of us, I think, but a um, lot more information to come about the volunteer program. But excuse me, one of my initial thoughts was given the fact that everyone's vaccinated now, Maybe there's a way to at least start some refamiliarization, if nothing more, so that individuals who are um, engaged previously will start to slowly but surely re-engage, and then we can see what that looks like uh, in the way of safety, in the way of training, in the way of um, ensuring that, that individuals are seeing this program as returning to viability. And so um, with that, uh, again, more conversation to come you know, with uh, Captain Nicola and others. So Papa Nicola rather and others. So um, last but not least, in the report, we have the fire department statistics and um, looking at the, the total response time, the average response time for engine 58 is actually a little bit slower than it had been in previous months. Uh, still well within the total response time dynamics that we'd like to see for our members being able to get out the door and get on scene to emergencies. Um, and I'm not sure if this is, you know, impacted in part by weather. You know, I think engineers drive a little more cautiously when they know the, the roads are slick, maybe when visibility is diminished because of heavy rain or um, cloudy conditions or otherwise. And so with that, um, it's not uncommon to see a, a slight downward, um, or should we say in this case, upward in the amount of time that it takes to get to an emergency. But um, otherwise, uh, I don't see anything abnormal and um, remain encouraged by, you know, the fact that our members are doing the fine job that they are doing. So if anyone has any questions on that, I'm more than happy to speak to it. I have one question. Mm -hmm. It's only just because of my curiosity. I saw the overturned vehicle on 101. Mm -hmm. um, I called it in and I was told that the San Rafael engine was on its way and I wanted to correct her and go it's actually we're in wood it's 58 but thank you um but my question is is when it falls right after the Miller Creek exit where this one happened how does the engine get to it do they have to go up to Ignacio and turn around well this is 
what I believe happens and what normally should happen, and I'm assuming it's probably happened in this instance too, is that the dispatcher was partially correct in stating that um, San Rafael rigs were en route as well. Yeah. And the reason why is when you have an incident on the freeway, you want to make sure you send opposing direction units. So that okay. way, sometimes a call comes in and tells you it's, it's a northbound incident where you discover later it's southbound. And now you've got some challenges trying to get off the freeway, circle back around and get to the incident in a timely manner. And so um, okay. because of the backup in traffic that may have actually occurred on that side of the freeway where the accident occurred, not, not to mention the, um, the folks that want to be the looky-loos and see what's going on from the other side of the freeway. So um, that being said, it, it's always a good practice to send opposing direction units, which would be San Rafael and Marinwood. Um, but in the case of a savvy engineer who has a good report on where this is located, mm -hmm. and if, if they tell you it's before an exit or past a certain exit, that clues them in to knowing I've got to take a different route to get on the freeway to be able to pick up this incident. Because if I don't do that, I'm going to overshoot it. And now I've got to double all the way back around, which takes again, even more time. So Correct. that's where receiving the information and the intelligence um, as precisely as possible becomes very helpful. And most dispatchers are pretty good about doing that because they understand that people are in need of help and it could be a delay if they can't pinpoint almost precisely where an incident occurs. The, the optimal thing at some point down the road would be able to train a camera onto the highway and be able to see and transmit that data back to a mobile data um, terminal or back to an iPad, which um, that case is, is coming here in the very near future with a, uh, a device our, our person will be using called Tablet Command, where they'll be able to access some of the wildfire cameras and maybe train and get a better gist of where something is. It may not be as easy for the engine companies who are responding to the incident, but the battalion chief, who's not really um, an essential first responder as far as providing medical aid, that individual may be able to pull it up, look at it, and communicate by radio to those other units. Hey, I'm seeing this at this location. And so that, again, is more information that can be helpful and shared to allow units to kind of, I should we say, triangulate a better position before they even get on the freeway or get close to making a, a choice. Well, true, because my, my follow-up question is if they had to go up to Ignacio and come back down, then that would affect the time response so you get on location, correct? It, it could, depending on where it was located, absolutely. But okay. again, that may be the better choice to make also, depending true. on the information that's provided to you. True, true. I'm just asking, yeah. And then I saw them respond, so. It was 58. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a question for you, Chief. Yes. Regarding what uh, Pas Pascal brought up, brought up last time uh, concerning the COVID vaccines, um, I know they have to be kept in a very uh, cold environment and they don't survive as long, but I've heard some from some friends that they've come to uh, a few of them have been able to uh, uh, show up at a location, various locations in the Bay Area. After the, the, the vaccines were given, they had some extras and they were able to get, uh, they were able to get a shot with, and it all happened within an hour or two. So I'm just wondering if, if in anywhere in, in Marin that, that is an, it has been the occasion at all. Um, I can say that I'm aware of it happening early on when we first started rolling out our units to provide vaccinations. Um, and so we would get the word that um, for whatever reason, there's five more vaccines available. Do you have a crew who's not been vaccinated yet? And if so, can they respond and come and get a vaccine? So I'm aware of that, but I'm not aware of any massive numbers of vaccines that have gone unadministered. And now they're starting to give them to the public, but I wouldn't be surprised because if there's overages, and there's not enough individuals there, you wanna make sure that you don't waste a vaccine. So it, it would almost seem to make sense that if you, if you can prioritize those individuals who are still there based on age and other essential criteria, that would make sense that you don't waste a vaccine, at least to me. Um, but I, I, don't, I can't speak to that happening on a regular basis. I just know that it happened maybe in the first week or so when we were receiving vaccines and we were providing them to the skilled nursing facilities and to the other first responders. 
Yeah. And, uh, this was actually in San Francisco, I think, last week. Somebody was telling me they were getting their shot, and they said, oh, we've got some extras. And he called up his friends, and he didn't call me. <laughs> wow. Steve, I, uh, I heard the same from my neighbors. Uh, they're in their early yeah. 70s, and they were at a CVS, I assume in Marin. And there was a line and a sign-up sheet, and a whole lot of people got vaccinated that day. Wow. So it seems mm. to be happening, and it seems like there was no particular – it's not – I know they're less, they're under 75, so, you know, they're close, but elderly, but under 75. So it, it seems to be happening. This was maybe well, two, three weeks ago. Would, would that have been extra that was unused, or was that just they were actually providing the service to individuals who showed up? I'm not, I'm not really sure. All they said is that it seemed fairly organized in that there was a sign-up sheet and a line, which seems okay. to be more than, you know, people five extra. Showing up. I'm sorry, what was that Steve? Uh, Steve? Uh, they said that people weren't showing up to their appointments, and, and so they had extra, that's what I heard, that they had extra vaccine because the people that were scheduled to show up that day didn't show up. Hmm. Right. Could be, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, that, that's great that they're able to get, yeah, at least so they don't waste it. That that's okay. They're not wasting it. Yeah, who's that? Tom? Yeah, this is Tom. I know several people in the neighborhood that showed up at the uh, Civic Center over at the theater and uh, just uh, stood in line and uh, received their vaccination and, uh, you know, all over 75. So uh, no questions asked. And, and uh, it's happening um, almost every day. Hmm. Wow. Uh, it's great to meet the criteria. They should be able to get the vaccine at 75 and older um, at this point. And again, it's my hope that they start moving that bar downward towards the 65 and older and eventually 55 and 45 and so forth. So for right now, though, um, you know, just administer the vaccinations. I, I think that's that's the huge thing. We're We're taking... And I don't know, and I'm not sure what, what the logistical challenge is, but it seems like we're taking a lot of time to provide vaccinations. And this, this, should, this should be a fairly straightforward thing where, you know, you get notified, you're coming, you get your vaccination, you keep it going. And it's done by age or some other, you know, systematic method. I just, I can't understand why it's continuing to be, you know, the, the challenge it is. It seems like it could be a I know, I'm, I'm, process. I'm a... Uh... Well, over 75, I'm 78 and uh, I'm having a difficult time. So I'm just uh, standing uh, and, and waiting my turn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will say that if anybody gets a chance to look at that Marin County CWPP, it's pretty interesting. I don't know how they, they got all that information of flame lengths and 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 there's there's actually a map in there that has uh past fires uh it, it's pretty interesting to take a look at if you get a chance um it, it it's in the chief's report and uh it's it's pretty amazing yeah. hey chief can i uh say something about uh, zone haven absolutely so I have known these guys for two or three years now. And, uh, you know, and they're great. And it had nothing to do with the selection, but it, it's great that they were selected. Um, one thing to note is they were originally founded by grants from the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, and the lady who takes care of that lives here in Marin. She lives in Ross. Um, and, you know, Rockefeller Foundation has a lot of interest in, in furthering uh, wildfire resilience. They tend to work with whichever fire chief will open their door. Uh, they are mostly active with South San Francisco and, um, shoot, it's in East Bay. It's two towns with a single fire department. Morocco Renda, maybe? Mar yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, Dave, Dave Sin no, wait, which I forget the name of the fire. Oh, gosh, I haven't spoken to a guy in a year. Anyway, uh, Marga Renda in South San Francisco, just because the, you know, the fire chiefs show up effectively. At, at those at those events uh so food for thought you know ladies and marin um if there are more you know now that marin has that extra funding you know if there are things that marin wants to try that are more experimental 
you know, Rockefeller has been generous with their time and money to, to help that. No, that, that's helpful to know, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, I think there's nothing that's, that we're not considering when it comes to, to trying to find tools that we believe may be helpful to the MWPA and to the community. So this is certainly um, one of probably many different things we'll be looking at. I think there's an evacuation study coming forward here pretty soon as well. So um, this is just a, the, the timing for them seems to be very well considering what they've already done in the Bay Area and considering our needs here as well. If that's at all helpful, uh, the fire chief of South San Francisco, uh, Chief Samson, lives here in San Rafael. Uh, so uh, if you don't know him, I'm happy to introduce you and he'll have a lot to say about what's been possible. I, I appreciate that. I have to tell you, I know Matt Sampson from uh, my days as a Special Operations Battalion Chief in Oakland, and he was in South San Francisco as a captain, and we, uh, we worked together on multiple occasions over the years. So we actually did speak again about Zone Haven because I wanted to know how their um, experience had been with Zone Haven over in San Mateo County. And so uh, I knew Matt would tell me straight and he, he spoke very fondly and, and highly of the program and how it's worked well, both during trainings and um, uh, their preliminary efforts to get it off the ground. So I am familiar with Matt, I understand. I didn't know though until I got to San Rafael that Matt actually was a volunteer in Marinwood. That's, a, that's where he got his start at the Marinwood fire department years ago so it's kind of a, a a great thing to see Marinwood having an impact on people that are doing so much in the Bay Area and elsewhere. It's awesome. There was a nice uh, write-up about the decision in the IJ just a few days ago too so if anybody hasn't seen that uh, um, you can find it online I'm sure if you just search zone haven on their website thanks go ahead steve you're muted sorry mr chairman <laughs> i move we adjourn <laughs> i just said i got a question ron first of all uh, will Zone Haven work with the NOAA radios? Can you guys hear I, me? I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think uh, the NOAA radio no. system ties into Zone Haven. I, I could be mistaken about that, but Zone Haven, from what I understand, ties in with Waze as an application. Um, but I don't know that it ties in with radio systems per se. Chief, what about in areas with no cell coverage? Well, that's, that's one of the huge question marks about what Zone Haven will be able to do in the way of providing something that could be a, a static map or something else. That could become a serious issue. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the challenge becomes, how do you access content um, if you don't have that connectivity? And I'm not quite sure if the connectivity is going to be or if they're going to be able to receive the information they need without the Wi-Fi. Yeah, we have a large dead zone, basically everything kind of east of the or west of the community center here, uh, all the way out through Lucas Valley Estates. If you're AT&T or Verizon, you you don't get a signal for the most part. Uh, in fact, we've had a lot of people, uh, especially from Lucas Valley Estates, ask us about it and try to get us to advocate to some of the major carriers to uh, look at you know an antenna or a responder or something along those lines that will help kick up because uh, you know a lot of people will have a micro cell but when your power goes out so does your micro cell right so you know maybe that's something else that the uh, prevention authority can kind of look at and lobby the uh, lobby the phone providers the cellular providers I think that's important. Um, we There's a another effort that's been underway for the last several years called uh, First Responder Network, FirstNet. And their goal was to provide nationwide coverage for even the most um, remote areas so that in, individuals that needed the internet, voice, data, et cetera, et cetera, would be able to do so um, without any hiccups. And AT&T won the contract. And I'm not sure how they're intending to close the gap in those remote areas, but since they won the contract and we need to have conversation with AT&T about the challenges we have here in Marin County as well. Okay. 
All right. Um, any public comment on that? On the chief's no, report? No public comment, Steve. No. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go to uh, number six, which is commissioner's request for future agenda items. Does anybody have any, uh, any commissioners have any requests for future items? I have no request. No. Okay. Ron, Pascal? No. Okay. Steve. Uh, yeah. Not so much a request, but just to let everybody know, I've been working with Chief White um, and more specifically uh, his veg management and emergency management team and are hoping that uh, by next month we'll be able to put together a joint meeting with uh, some plan, you know, to kind of give an update on our uh, planned uh, Marin, you know, our, our veg management projects for open space using the MWPA funds. Um, as mentioned, uh, the PNR Commission is interested in that as well, so we're hoping to turn that into a joint meeting. Um, you know, it'll a chance to ask some questions, look at what we're looking at and how we're basing decisions, um, uh, you know, for very near term as well as kind of longer term uh, projects or even, you know, recurring cycles of uh, specific projects. So we're hoping for that for March. Uh, depending on the timing of that and people's availability, We'll either try to schedule that for the regular fire commission date or possibly the PNR commission date, which is uh, the fourth Tuesday of the month. So I'll, as we learn more, um, I'm meeting again with them next week. Um, we'll see if we can't pin down some timing and be able to share that information as well. Okay, sounds good. Okay, just one last note on the issue of that sense. Um, just looking at that, it seems that uh, Starlink has been loading receivers to uh, emergency services uh, in dead zones when fighting fires. Uh, Stalling's work from pretty much anywhere, so that could potentially be a way to get some connectivity for the fire department in the dead zones. Can you repeat the, the system, Starlink? Starlink, the SpaceX uh, satellite receivers. Oh, okay. If you Google uh, Starlink's, you know, Oregon wildfires, you see they've been providing them to uh, fire services uh, for, for dead zones. Uh, that's great to know. Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure, Chief. Okay. Anything further? Because if, if uh, we're, we're done here, we'll look for a motion to adjourn. I know, Ron. All right. <laughs> okay. It was nice to have all of you here to this, this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank and you. Uh, once again, welcome, Kathleen. It's nice to have you here. Thank and you. And I apologize again for uh, my computer mishap. I just, and then of course I lost, somewhere I lost, or somebody stole, I don't know, my iPad. So normally everything would come up my iPad. So I got to get a new iPad. But I had to download all of, of the Zoom stuff all over again. And couple of conversations with Eric and Eric helped me through it. So thanks, Eric. Anyway. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you now. Bye. All right. Thank you. Chief, Chief, I'll give you a call on yourself. Does that work? Yeah, that's good. Great. I'll give you a call in two minutes. Okay, no worries. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Hey sir. Eric, can I ask you a question really quick? Um sure. What would be something that I would ask or add when it's a commissioner's items of interest? Um, let's, uh, let me get with you and I'll, I'll, we can talk okay. about that. That's fine. It's just the one. Okay. Yeah. Think about it and let me know or what. Yeah. No, I, yeah it's primarily just a, uh, you know, various things that aren't necessarily on the agenda but related to the commission it's things that commissioners can bring up um okay and a lot of times those will become future agenda items they're not meant for discussion or round tabling they're okay. just you know very simple items uh hey i've noticed that the weeds are getting out of control at this area or okay. uh something along those lines and sometimes those will just turn into additional you know future agenda items okay and then just my quick follow-up if it's something that was addressed in a board meeting that has to come to this meeting, would you add it to the agenda or would that be something that I bring up in this subject and it gets added for future, future agendas? No, usually if it came from the board saying, hey, I'd like the commission to talk about this, uh, it'll hit the agenda before that. 
Okay, perfect. Awesome. Good. Thank you. Have a good Bye night. Now. Bye.